your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 7. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. And call understanding thy kinswoman. That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my casement casement being the lattice, they didn't have glass. And beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street. What I'm going to talk to you about this morning is a term that maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't. It's called street smart. You can be book smart, and that's great, you need to be, but Sometimes that won't help you if you're not street smart, okay? Let's go on and read about this young man who was simple because he was inexperienced, he was young, he was void of understanding, and someone watching on could tell, even though at the moment he thought he was the smart one, at the moment he thought he was very ingenious, at the moment he thought he was shrewd and, and uh, wise, anyone looking on would notice him as the fool. Anyone watching this would say, he doesn't understand. He's not smart uh, in the sense of the long-term survival, uh, so forth. Passing through the street near her corner, he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me, which means I have some nice cuts of meat left over from the offering at the temple. And so I, I've got a meal prepared this day. I paid my vows. Uh, I've got some excellent uh, cuts of beef or, or not beef, but lamb or uh, goat or something. I have some really good meat at home. And I suppose it could have been beef depending on what her offering was. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. With a much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox, goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver. Everybody knows that means quick, clean kill. Heart, lungs, liver, if you've ever taken a hunting course. As a bird hasteneth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. <clears throat> Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, Attend to my words, the words in my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Not necessarily the same woman, but the same type. This is a type. This is a scenario. And so this type is, is many different places. Her house, all of them, every one of them, is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. Now, notice he said, I, I beheld among the simple ones. It doesn't mean this man was really uh, retarded or stupid. It means that he was inexperienced, and in that sense, he was stupid. He was uninformed. He was, he was a void of understanding. And at the same time, he thought he was really smart. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of young men. I've seen people, adults and youth, who could give you the right answer from the book. They knew the term. They could argue doctrine. And yet I see them sucked in and overcome by things 
that they should have been smart to. The word street smart means a shrewd awareness of how to survive or succeed in a difficult environment. Basically knowing the dangers of a particular part of town, a particular culture, a particular people, knowing how to survive and thrive. There are predatory people in the world. There are predatory spirits out there in the world, okay? You take somebody from the city, take them from the ghettos of Chicago. They know how, they're street smart to their area. They know how to survive, they know where not to go, when not to go, who not to talk to. They know the dangers. You bring them out on the farm and they might end up getting kicked by a horse. They may not know that you don't stand behind a horse, okay? They may not know to stay away, to not get between the cow and the corn. <coughs> There's things they don't know because they're not street smart to this environment. You take someone from the country who knows all about cows, chickens, and horses and put them in Chicago and they might end up dead, robbed, or who knows what. Okay? Because they're not street smart to that environment. They may be smart, they may have a good education, but if they don't know that environment, they're in danger. Street smart means it's gained by experience. You know, we went to the prison and visited a man in prison. And you'd be shocked at the prison dress code. On the prison dress code, it shows the figure of a person, not a stick man, but a regular a form of a body. And it has a box like this, a shaded area. Basically, that all has to be covered. Nothing above the knee, no sleeveless, no low necklines. Uh, it, their standard for visitors to the prison is higher than 90% of the churches in America. Most of, the, most of what people wear to church, they could not wear in the prison to visit inmates in the prison. Why? What textbook did they get that from? No, it's called Street Smart. It's called common sense for this environment. It's called common sense when we're dealing with this subject. Churches don't have it. They've thrown it away. The prison is not trying to get visitors. The prison's not concerned about pleasing people. The prison is concerned about common sense safety in this environment, okay? It's serious business. They're concerned about safety. They're aware of the dangers. Churches are not taking life serious. They're not aware of the dangers. They're concerned about getting people in. So they don't care about dress code. And they have the casualties that the prison doesn't. On the sign of the dress code in the prison, it says all decisions are final. We're not going to argue with you about it. If we say, nope, you can't go in like that, you leave. Go online and look at the dress code. It's not the same one that's posted inside of the waiting room. And I wanted to take a picture of it, but you can't have cameras in there. You can't have your phone in there, okay? Uh, I, I wanted to take a picture. I thought, that, that's good. I want to get that, but there's no way to do it. I went online. It's different. It's, it's a little more vague. But what they tell you online is the smart thing to do is bring a change of clothes in the car just in case they tell you no. Serious. What it says. Why? They're street smart. They know what's going on. They don't, want to, they don't want any problems and they know what causes problems. Okay? You know, you can read books and books about pouring concrete. You can know about the chemical components, the strength, the technical facts. But if you've never poured concrete, you better find someone who has. Okay? There are matters you cannot learn in a textbook. It comes from experience. When we went down camping in Arkansas, the guy that was there, uh, uh, rep, you know, taking care of the place, the uh, not a, he wasn't he wasn't a warden, but he was a volunteer, uh, like a warden, uh, taking care of the place there. And he said his term was those wacky tourists. He kept saying it, those wacky tourists. People come down there, and. In a book, they've read about river rafting. And then they get out there and get drowned. And he said, we're continually having to call in. He was talking to us about it because the Mennonites in the area, a lot of them are volunteer first responders who help out in these situations. He was just talking to us about it, okay? They get out there and they get drowned. There was one situation where they're out of this, this cliff, this guy and his girlfriend, okay? 
And this is a huge drop-off, but they wanted to get pictures. And he's taking a picture of her, and he says, I want you to get over here. And she stands over there. And all of a sudden, it's, it's, it's a rock slide. She starts sliding. And she slides over the cliff and dies. Okay? That guy may have had a PhD, but he was stupid to the environment. You don't do that. You don't get out there by the edge. There were some young Mennonite uh, youth down in, uh, I think it was, down by the ocean, I think in Mexico, I think it was. And I believe they were from Canada. Anyways, they got off the trail. And they got over closer to the edge. They wanted to see more. They thought, we know how to do this. We're smart. We're not stupid. We're okay. You know, this trail is made for stupid people who don't know what we know. So they got off the trail, went over the railing, got over by the edge. And guess what? One of them got in some loose gravel that was over there and uh, he slid and they couldn't save him and he went over the edge into the ocean water. He hit a ledge and then went into the ocean and they watched him down there struggling with a broken arm trying to, to get somewhere and they watched him drown. A nice young man like the nice young men we have in the congregation here. He was not street smart, smart to this particular situation and he died. He may, have been, he may have been through school and had all the book learning. He, may, he was probably a sincere young man. But he made some bad mistakes because he assumed knowledge he didn't have. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 6. If you read Adam Clark's commentary on the last few verses of this chapter, he basically says that anybody uh, without the shrewdness of Nehemiah, without a man like this in charge, this work would have never been done. It took someone who was smart. He was not only book smart, he not only knew the law of God, but he was smart to the ways of his environment and the people of his environment. Um, now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. How did he know that? He was smart to it, wasn't he? Okay? I'm sure they were being really nice. And if he had thought, oh, niceness is the most important thing, they're being nice, i got to be nice, he, that's called stupidity. He knew that just because they're being nice, they're speaking nice words. No, no, I, I see what's going on here. He was smart to it, okay? And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Well, that wasn't very nice. Was that Christ-like? Yes, it was. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashemu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. What's he going to do now? Now they're making threats. They're, they're trying to twist his arm. Then I said unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Well, he knew where to go, didn't he? Afterward I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabiel, who were shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee, and who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Salmon Ballot had hired him. So, this was a prophet claiming to be giving him a word from God. 
But he said, no, no, no. This isn't from God. He was smart to it, wasn't he? Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so in sin, and they might have a matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. There is a deep state issue going on here in this chapter in which Nehemiah not only has enemies from without, he has enemies within. Okay? So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month, Elul, in fifty and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Moreover in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son jo Johanan uh, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Also they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him, and Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. He's fighting enemies on all fronts right there. And it had not been for the fact that he was street smart to this situation. He was shrewd. He understood not only his times, he understood what was going on here. He also walked with God. God gave him wisdom. He knew when to pray. He survived. Why do con artists target youth? Why do they target women? Why would they target the new kid on the block? Because they know. They know who is shrewd enough to be aware and who might just be a victim. Eve was the new kid on the block at one time and Satan didn't go talk to Adam. In 1 Timothy 3.6 it says of a bishop or a minister not a novice. That's what we're talking about. Not a novice. Less being lifted up with pride. You see what happens to novices? Novices are those who think they're the smart one. They think they're the one who's got it all figured out. They're, they think that's like that young man going through the dark night, the way he thought, man, I'm, I'm so cool. I know so much. Nobody's going to know it. Nobody, I'm, I'm going to do all this. And I'm going to, you know, I do it behind people's backs. I'm so smart. And the guy looking out the window said, you're an idiot. You're the simple one. You think you're the smart one. Not a novice. Let's be lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. Have you ever seen someone led away, led astray, snared? Have you ever seen an animal walk into a snare? It talks about the ox. The dumb ox led to slaughter. <coughs> you know, we call our cows, pry a little bit of corn, we load them in the trailer. They don't know. They're going to the slaughterhouse. We know. We're being nice for that reason. We're giving them corn for that reason, right? We're, we're, we're gaining their trust for that reason. The bird in the snare. The Bible says a snare set in the sight of a bird is, is vain. So you set it and you, you make sure when you set a snare that you don't have any smell on it. If you're going to trap coyotes or trap rodents, you are careful not to leave your odor. You set a snare and you put the odor like... Uh, you tap rabbit urine if you want to catch coyotes you put that all around make sure that everything looks natural make sure that they're not going to be suspicious the devil knows all this do you know everyone in that prison thought I'm smarter than the average they didn't expect to get caught you know the greatest part of my visit there as I went into this place with high walls, towers, razor wire, chain link, steel doors, bulletproof glass. It's a funny feeling walking in a place like that. And the best part of the day was when I could walk out. A free man. I could walk out. I could get in my car and I could drive away. It's sad that the person I was visiting could not and will not for many, many years. All those men in that prison were once little four-year-old boys 
created for God's glory and God's purposes. Every man in that prison listened to the wrong voices. Are you listening this morning? They thought they were the smart one. They thought they had it figured out. They thought it wouldn't hurt them. They thought they wouldn't get caught. Who do flatterers like to target? In Romans 16, 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. The ones who don't have enough understanding of the whole, the environment, what's really going on, to say, you're a deceiver. They don't have the street smarts to survive Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. Proverbs 7, 7. Behold, I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. Now, do you know that drunks think they're the most capable? Intoxication impairs discernment. Impaired discernment produces false confidence. The inexperienced think they are the smartest and most capable to discern. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, Are you not carnal? Don't you see this as babe stuff? And yet you think you're elevated. The very fact that you think you're elevated proves that you're a babe. He said here, But strong meat belonging to them that are of full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised, to discern both good and evil. So you can know your Bible. Young man, young lady, new convert. You can know the right answers. But if you haven't been in this warfare for very long, you better pay attention. You better watch those who have been in it for a while. And you better listen. The very fact that the Corinthians were thinking they were smart. And not needing instruction. The very fact was because they were babes and needed instruction. Why are you doing that? Oh, it's cool. It's cool. Who told you that? Who told you it was cool? Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, who told you it was cool? And why did they tell you it was cool? And where did they come from? Did Sam Ballot hire them? Who told you it was cool? There's a lot of people who think you look like an idiot. Who told you it's cool? What basis? What motive? Where did it come from and where are you going? That's what you need to wake up and think about. Oh, it's fun. Yeah, so it's falling from the sky without a parachute. For a while. Oh, it's good. So it's the cheese in the mouse trap. You listening this morning? When Hushai defeated the good counsel of Ahithophel, who was the novice? Absalom. Ahithophel wasn't a novice. Hushai wasn't a novice. Absalom was the novice. Okay? But who thought he was the smartest of all? Absalom. Yeah. When Delilah made a fool of Samson, who thought he was invincible? Who thought he was the smartest? Who thought it could never happen to him? Samson. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Are you street smart when it comes to the narrow way? The Bible says he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Oh yeah, I, I went to Sunday school. I've got all the answers. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. You listening this morning? I don't care if you know your Sunday school lesson and memorize your memory verse. You need to have some street smarts when it comes to dealing with the devil and the narrow road and life. I see young people taking a liking to a particular attitude, style, look, hair, dress, whatever. And I say, I know where that came from. I know who's, who's pushing that. Oh, they just think, oh, this looks cool. 
Who told you that? Who told you? God repeats himself, and when he does, you better pay attention. In Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It's always the confident hotshots that blow it. It's always the confident hotshots that blow it. Because the very fact that they're confident shows they're not street smart. They're cocky and confident, and the shrewd person who knows the street says he won't last long. The shrewd person who knows where the cons are and the robbers are and who the criminals are says that that guy is in trouble. He's cocky. He's confident. He's not watching out. He won't last long in the real world. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Titus 2, 2, That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. Titus 2, 4, That they may teach the younger women to be sober, Titus 2, 6, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. 1 Peter 1, 13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. There are predatory people and predatory spirits. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Whether they be of God, for there are many false prophets gone out into the world. I've been around a while. I've been around the block a few times. I've seen a lot of people come and go. I've seen a lot of would-be heroes trampled in the battlefield. I've seen a lot of cocky, confident, know-it-all people who then are led astray by the next con on the road. So let's talk about street smarts. Here's a few things. Number one, pay attention to the dangers. Know what could happen in this environment. Get smart to the dangers. Number two, know what type of people to stay away from and avoid them. Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. We have had young men from this very congregation get snared by bad girls in this town. Oh, we little rural area, harmless little Brookfield. No. No. The devil is shrewd. And if you're not street smart on the narrow road and street smart for the world you live in, you will be victimized by the devil who's out to devour you because he is so much smarter than you think you are. And if you don't have some street smarts, you're done. It's just a matter of time. Number three, don't trust anyone that has not earned trust. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Believe not every spirit. But try the spirits whether they are of God. Number four, know your limitations and don't presume upon your strength. Like Samson. Know your limitations. Don't go walking down through the dark part of town thinking I can whoop anybody. You're gonna, they're going to mop the floor with you. You're gonna, you, you'd be good to get out of there with your life and they'll have everything you own. Don't go down. Know, know what part of town to stay away from. Know your limitations. You're not bulletproof. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. You see someone walking around thinking they're cool and tough and smart. They're not on their face praying. They haven't been in the Word of God. They're not, they don't have, they don't have the breastplate of righteousness. Their loins aren't going about with truth. It's like, man... You're exactly what the enemy is looking for. You're just exactly what's going to fit in his mousetrap. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. It says here, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, the bad day, the, the, the crisis time, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Does that mean at the very moment? No. That means you've, you've been doing that. That means this is preparation. You walk every day with your loins girt about with truth. And then when the crisis comes, that's going to help pull you through. You walk every day with the breastplate of righteousness. You walk every day with this armor on. You are familiar with your armor. Why didn't David want to take Saul's armor to fight Goliath? I have not proved it. I'm not familiar with it. So you think you're going to suddenly grab God's armor real quick and put it on when you're in a crisis and you're facing an enemy? No. You have to have proved it. You have to have used it. You must be comfortable with it. Or you're done. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith where we're wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Shield of faith quenching fiery darts. That means we're dealing with mind issues. This whole thing has to do with the battle of the mind. Okay? Righteousness. Truth. Uh, faith. Fiery darts are dealing with your thinking processes. Oh, it's cool. Who told you that? Oh, I'm cool. Who told you that? I'll tell you who told you that. It's a fiery dart. You think you're smarter than God. You're not reading His Word. You're not getting your smarts from His book and from walking with His armor and living godly. You think you've all got it figured out from your two eyeballs and your ears and the great stuff between it. Woe unto you. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, I've seen a lot of young men raised in a good home and young ladies too. Raised in a relatively good home. In other words, the parents, they may have even been members of this church or the church I grew up in or went to the Bible college I went to. I'm thinking of a lot of people who had a Christian home, who had a Bible to read, who knew they should pray, who knew about Ephesians 6. Okay? I memorized this in Sunday school when I was a kid. They knew it. And yet, where are they? Where are they now? <laughs> they, they were confident at one time. And they still don't realize they've been undone. They still don't realize they're in a trap. They still don't realize they're still chewing on the cheese in the mouse trap. They don't perceive it. They're blinded to it. But anybody looking on would say, the ox is going to the slaughter. Anybody looking on with any spiritual discernment knows, you're already done. You're already snared. Number five, stay with the right crowd and watch each other's backs. Hebrews 10.24, let us consider one another as provoke unto love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Number six, stay away from dark or secluded areas. Spiritually dark, no accountability, being alone. 
don't get separated from the rest of the herd. The lion, the jackals, the hyenas, all predatory animals want to separate this one, the target, from the rest of the herd. Get them off alone. Number seven, don't attract attention to yourself. Through immodesty, riches, boasting. Man, don't go down through the bad part of town and say, oh boy, I got lots of money. <laughs> People say, man, he's done. Don't go down walking through the back, bad part of town with your immodest clothes trying to attract attention. You're a fool. Don't go down through the bad part of town boasting about your muscles, how big they are. Come on. Don't attract attention to yourself. You stay on the humble road with God's people. Stay in the herd. Stay with God's crowd. Stay in the good area. Stay in the light. Be street smart. Number eight. Know when to run and where to run. Joseph is an example of that. Joseph was not as shrewd and smart as he should have been, but at least he knew when to run. Now, let me say concerning Joseph, the devil, you may be too smart for him to rob you or lead you into actual transgression, but he would like to just get you in a situation that makes you look suspect. He would like to get you in a situation that makes you look bad. He would like to smear your testimony, even if he's lying. If he gets you in a bad situation, his lies will, will seem to have credibility. And so even though the devil may not get you to actually trespass the law of God, like Joseph, he's going to try to get you in a situation where it makes it look like you did. You've got to be smart to that as well. Number nine. Stay in good with the authorities. Stay close to the shepherd. The wolf is not going to attack the lamb that's staying close to the shepherd. If 99% of the men in prison had honored their parents, they would not be there. Just by honoring their parents. Is this, would your mom, did your mom and dad teach you this? No. Did your mom and dad show you this? No. Why'd you do it? Were your mom and dad against this? Yes. Why'd you do it? Because you weren't honoring your parents. That's why. You weren't honoring the good things they taught you. You thought you were too smart to follow, and so you wanted to go your own way. And that's 99% of the men in prison. That's the beginning of why they're there. If 99% of the people in prison had simply honored God and His authority structure, respected the law, stay on the right side of the law, God's law, and God's law when it, when it is shown down through man's law, just stay on the right side of the law. That's honoring God. That's honoring authority. Those men wouldn't be sitting in prison. Turn to Matthew 24 and with this I close. I told the fellow that I was visiting in prison, I said, you know what I think a big problem is? I said, the world is insulated to this reality. I told him, I said, if you had not been insulated to this reality, if you had realized that what this was, you probably would have fought twice before you messed up. What about hell? Wouldn't it be nice to load you up on a bus and take a tour of hell? But I think it would be good if we took young people and walked them in a tour through the prison at least. Most young people in their neighborhood, with their, their friends, their school, they think that they can do what they want to do. 
And they think they can do things and they won't get caught. Nobody will ever know. And next thing you know, they do the wrong thing and the authorities are alerted and they're arrested. And they go to court. And this judge says, 20 years. 20? 20 years? That means if you're 20, you'll be 40 when you get out. And then the parole after he gets out of this particular man, he said, I gotta find out what this means. It says three years to life. My life is totally changed till I die, possibly. But it's changed, no doubt. You go in when you're 30, you get out when you're 50. And if I had if that person had thought about that and not been dumb to it. They would have never gotten near the crime that they committed. But because they were insulated and ignorant and not thinking about the consequences, Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of war, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended or stumbled out of the way. And shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity, lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Are you listening this morning? You need to get smart. You need some street smarts about the narrow road and about life. He that shall endure unto the end. I can guarantee you the one that endures to the end is not the confident, cocky, presumptuous one. Not. He that endures to the end is the sober, serious, praying, seeking God, uh, vigilant, diligent one. I promise you that. Let's stand together. We always want it really peaceful for the mouse to feel comfortable getting closer to the cheese. For the bird to get closer to the snare. Don't want anybody to scare them off. Make everything feel tranquil. Don't, want it, don't slam the door, the mouse will run back and get away. Make everything seem safe and secure and calm. The devil is not a fool. And if you're not street smart, if you can't say, I don't like the looks of that cheese. I don't trust that situation. Nobody leaves cheese out that easy to get. There's something wrong with this scenario. There's something wrong here and I'm not going to get close to it. I'm getting away from here. Are you, are you that smart? Are you smart enough to say that looks really good? But there's something too good to be true about this situation. Are you smart enough to shut off your appetite? You said, oh jeez, I want cheese. Mm -hmm. Because I want cheese, this is good. Stupid. But the people live like that all the time. You need some street smarts or you're not going to survive. You're not going to endure to the end unless you get shrewd and wise and careful and smart about predatory people and predatory spirits. That's right. 
Any thoughts? Let's pray.